Okay, so here we are with uh, lesson number one, the introduction to sound. And we're going to go through a whole bunch of different little concepts in this lesson um, that add up to kind of the basis of the most important um, basics that you need to know. So we're going to start with wave theory. And you can see in general that there are three types of waves. Transverse and longitudinal are the most important for our purposes and we're going to throw in a discussion of torsional waves just because. But in general a transverse wave is a wave where um, the motion of the wave itself is perpendicular to the motion of the particles. Okay. This is a transverse wave. And um, one very common example that many of you may be able to relate to is when you swim in a lake or in the ocean um, and a wave passes you by, the motion of the particles or the motion of the water molecules or the motion of the people who are swimming is to bob up and down in this direction while the wave moves in this direction. And you can see that the motion of the bobbing up and down is perpendicular to the motion of the wave which goes in towards the shore. Okay. Um, another common example of, the, of a transverse wave is of course what you'd see at any sporting event. Uh, the people in their seats move up and down. They sit up, uh, sorry, they stand up and they sit down so they move up and down. But the motion of the wave is perpendicular to that and it goes around the stadium. A longitudinal wave though is not where you have the motion of the wave parallel uh, perpendicular you have it parallel to so the motion of the wave is parallel to the motion of the particles and this uh, an example of this we're going to do in class um, and the example that we're going to do is where we have a spring and we send a pulse down the spring you'll notice that of course here the wave is going to move in this direction and the pieces of spring themselves will move back and forth in that direction as well. Okay, uh, As it turns out, sound is a longitudinal wave where we have pressure buildup um, and then pressure release as a, a wave moves through the air. It's a pressure wave. And we're going to talk about what that looks like in a couple minutes. A torsional wave is where the motion of the wave twists somehow through the material. So an example would be uh, some kind of a disc that's attached to an axle and if we um, twist that disc up and then let it go it will of course vibrate back and forth and back and forth kind of in a twisting motion. So those are the three types of waves. Now we're going to come down here, um, really let's just define what a wave is. A wave is a transfer of energy through a medium. Okay, So some waves, like ripples on a pond, are going to repeat over and over and over again. You can see that they're waves and they repeat. Other waves, however, are just a single pulse and that's like a tidal wave. Okay. Um, Transverse and longitudinal waves physically are very different, but they both represent recurring cycles of the same motion. So we're going to turn our attention now not to the tidal wave um, example, but ripples on a pond. Waves that repeat and that are periodic in nature. So periodic behavior like that associated with waves is any behavior that repeats at predictable intervals. This type of motion is represented mathematically by a sine curve. And if you have had grade 11 physics, uh, excuse me, grade 11 math, you, uh, you will be well aware of the sine function, y equals sine x. Um, and here is an example of, of y equals sine x, where you have a, um, the function is defined in red here. And of course, past uh, the end point, of course, this would continue on over here and of course before the function this would of course continue on over here but we haven't graphed that we've really just graphed one complete cycle so let's define some characteristics first of all 
a cycle is a complete sequence of motion that repeats itself. So what's drawn here is one cycle. Okay, so a cycle is one complete uh, sequence of motion, of course, then that repeats itself in predictable interviews, intervals. The wavelength, then, is the physical, the geometrical length of one cycle. And here I've sketched this. If we go from the start point of this wave to the end point of this wave, and we were to measure this distance, this distance x, this would be the wavelength. This is the length of the wave. We measure it in meters, and it's given the symbol lambda. Okay, And this is an important symbol. This is a Greek letter. It is a slash with a tail. Okay, So it's kind of, um, you can see it. It's like a curly bit, and then you've got a little tail down here. And this is a lambda. Okay, That's the symbol for wavelength. The period is very similar to wavelength, but it's not the length of the wave in distance. It's the length of the wave in time. So period is defined as the time to complete one cycle. And of course, then we would say if we started our watch at this point right here, tick, 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 and we ended our watch at this point right here, we would have the time to complete one full cycle, and this is known as the period. Period is, of course, measured in seconds, and because it's a special kind of time, we give it a capital letter T. All right, the frequency is the number of cycles per second. The number of cycles per second. It is the inverse of the period. Period is the time to complete one cycle, Frequency is the number of cycles per second. It carries the units one over seconds because cycles, it's cycles per second. Cycles isn't a unit, it doesn't have a unit. So we just say one over seconds. We could also say seconds to the negative one. But the most common that you're going to see is the unit hertz. Hertz, H-E-R-T-Z, has capital H, small z. And this is the symbol that we give and for, for the unit of frequency. The symbol for frequency is a curly F, and there you have it. The last thing that we want to talk about is amplitude, and the amplitude is the maximum disturbance of the wave from its zero point. So you can see here the wave's zero point is, of course, the x-axis, and the maximum disturbance would be A, but also the minimum disturbance is also the amplitude, and that's kind of implied by our units on the axes here and here. The amplitude is simply just this distance. We measure it in meters, and it's given the symbol A. Okay, continuing on with this, um, since waves are traveling disturbances, they have a velocity that's associated with them, or a speed. It can be shown that V is equal to F lambda. So that's the speed of the wave, V, is equal to its frequency times its wavelength. This is an important equation. It's so important that we call it the universal wave equation because it applies to all types of waves. The velocity would be measured in meters per second, the frequency in hertz, and the distance or the wavelength in meters. Okay. Here's a couple examples to kind of work through some of this. Calculate the period and frequency of a tuning fork whose tines vibrate back and forth at 375 times in three seconds. All right, so going through this, we have first that the period is defined as the time for one cycle. So in this case, we have period is equal to three seconds, but that's three seconds for 375 cycles. So if we divide this to get our unit rate we get T, the period, is equal to 0 0.008 seconds per one cycle. Now, we don't have to write per one cycle. It's just implied. But if we're going to correct this to the, to the correct number of significant figures, we get T is equal to 8.00 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds. 
So that's very fast. That's 8 milliseconds. The question also asks us to calculate frequency. And frequency is defined as the number of cycles in a second. So this is either the number of cycles in a second, or it's the inverse of the period. So we can calculate this. Well, we had 375 cycles, but not in one second. We had that in three seconds. And when we do this division, we get 125 hertz. But it can be just as easily shown that if I simply take 1 divided by the period, which was 0 0.008, I get the same answer, 125 hertz. So that's a quick um, example to kind of talk about period and frequency. Let's go on to example number two, which builds on example one. Calculate the speed of the sound wave leaving the tuning fork in example one if the wavelength of one cycle is 275 centimeters. Now, one quick note about this. We have to use units of meters. Always we're using units of meters, seconds, okay, and eventually kilograms when we start talking about mass. But here, we want to change this. Lambda is equal to 275 centimeters, which is equal to 2.75 meters. You can see that our use of uh, metric conversions is going to come in handy over and over and over again. The frequency was given above 125 hertz, and we're going to use the universal wave equation V is equal to F lambda to solve this. V is equal to F lambda. We sub in our two values, and we get 343.75 meters per second. We're going to check the question, and we're going to make note of the fact that we have three significant figures, and we're going to round and do our final statement. The speed of the wave is 344 meters per second. All right, example three. Using this diagram of a periodic wave, solve for the amplitude, the wavelength, the frequency, and the velocity. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to start with the things that we can solve simply by looking at it. So when you look at this wave, you notice that, of course, the amplitude, both positive and negative, it goes up to 2, and it goes down to negative 2. So the amplitude of this wave is 2 meters, and we've solved that by inspection. We have to write by inspection just so that um, it, it's not like we're not doing any work here. We're just looking at the graph. So we're being very specific with our communication. The other thing that we can solve is, of course, the wavelength. When the wave physically starts here and ends here, I can measure this distance along the x-axis, 0 to 4 meters is my, is my distance. And so the, the wavelength of this is 4 meters, and I've solved this, again, by inspection. The period was given to us. Uh, the period was given to us. This is, yep, there we go. Uh, t is equal to 0 0.05 seconds. That's right down here. And so then the frequency is 1 over the period, which if you do a quick calculation is 200 hertz. V is equal to F lambda is the universal wave equation. Frequency is 200 hertz. The wavelength is 4 meters. And I calculate that the speed of this wave is 800 meters per second. And correcting for the for the full number of significant digits, which in this case is 1, 8 times 10 to the 2 meters per second, 800 meters per second. All right, last couple of details. There's a diagram here uh, that you can draw. Um, and this is about how sound is transmitted through the air. Sound is a long, longitudinal wave. And it requires a medium through which to travel. So when sound travels through the air, what happens is, is that our, um, the sound will create, and in this case it's someone's vocal cords, create pressure waves, regions of high pressure and low pressure that spread out in a wave fashion and, of course, hit our ears. And those pressure fluctuations will then vibrate our eardrums. And this is how we both speak and how we hear. You'll notice, though, 
that in the air there's regions of high pressure where the, where the air molecules all bunch up like this, and there's regions of low pressure where the air molecules all stretch out like this. This is how sound travels longitudinally. The dense areas of air are called compressions, and the less dense areas of air are called rarefactions. And, and air is one example of a medium through which sound can travel. But sound also travels through other mediums. It travels through really anything, because sound is simply a vibration. You'll notice that the density of the material plays a pretty big factor on the speed of sound in that material. It's not linear, and it's not perfect, but it does have an effect. And in general, the more dense, if you look at air as one example, and say iron as another example, you'll see that the more dense, definitely the faster the speed of sound. Not in all cases, but in many cases. Let's take a look at an example of this. The speed of sound in hardwood is 4,000 meters per second. How long does it take sound to travel through a hardwood floor from one end of a very long banquet hall to the other? The banquet hall is 100 meters. How long does this take? So first of all, this is what we're given. We're given the velocity of sound in hardwood is 4,000 meters per second. The time is what, we're, is what we don't know. And that's why I've highlighted how long does it take. This is telling us, this is asking us to find time. Okay? And of course, we know the distance the sound's going to travel. It's 100 meters. So many of you will remember from um, probably grade 10 math, maybe even from um, physics at some point along the way, that when you have something traveling at a constant speed, which sound does, velocity is equal to distance over time. Now, that, a hint of that is the units. Meters over second is a unit of distance over a unit of time. And so we're going to use this equation to solve for our time that it takes. So first of all, we've got 4,000 meters per second and that's equal to our distance, which is 100, divided by time. When I rearrange this equation, I get 100 divided by 4,000, and I can cancel a couple zeros, and I realize I end up with one part in 40, which ends up being 0 0.025 seconds. So that is very, very, very fast um, that it would travel across a very large banquet hall. Speed of sound is also dependent on the temperature, not just the medium. And when the temperature increases, we know this from chemistry, the particles in the substance increase their kinetic energy. What that means is, is that when there's more kinetic energy um, in the substance through which sound is traveling, sound, the speed of sound will actually increase. Here, for the air, this is the equation that we get. The speed of sound is equal to 332 plus 0 0.6 T, where T is the temperature in degrees Celsius. So our final example for the lesson is given a summer temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, find the speed of sound. So we have 20 degrees, and we know the equation that we're going to use. And really, it is as simple as popping it into the equation and saying this is 30, 332 plus 12 and we get 344 meters per second. And we'd say, OK, therefore, the speed of sound at 20 degrees is about 3.4 times 10 to the 2 meters per second, <coughs> once we've corrected for sig figs. And that's the end of lesson number one.